If you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Over these next few weeks, we're starting a new series called The Miracles of Jesus. And I'm going to speak really uh, shortly today. And then we're going to worship again together and just have a time to respond. And uh, I don't know about you, but just in the midst of worship then, just the sense of God, pres- God presence in Himself amongst us. And, uh, and God wants to do something in us and through us. And so we want to create some space for that at the end um, today. But I'm going to be reading from John chapter 2 as we talk about the miracles of Jesus. This is the first miracle that's recorded in the Gospels that Jesus carries out. It's right at the beginning, the the second chapter of John's Gospel. And it's the first of the seven signs that John goes on to share throughout his Gospel. And I love the backdrop of, of the story because it tells us that Jesus is at a party. Anybody like a party? There are three types of people I know in this room. They are the extroverts, which feed off a party. And you can see them at a party, feeding off the party. You can see them as they hustle and bustle and as they chat and as they get up and dance and as they just enjoy the the atmosphere. There's the extroverts. They love a party. That they live for the party. In fact, if they're not invited to a party... They go into a season of depression because they want to be at the party. Hands up if you're an an extrovert in here. Come on, you can, yep, own up today. There are some in here. There's the introverts who, let's be honest, you have to recover from being at the party. And you can tell where the introverts are at a party because they usually sat down in the background or making a quiet entrance, an exit, so nobody knows. Ever done that? I go to the party, hey, hey, well, good to see everyone, and then leave early and then spend the next day recovering from the social activity and the drain on you that it's cost. Anyone identify with that? Are the introverts in here? And then there's a middle ground. There's those of us, and and I sit in this category, I'm an introvert but have extrovert tendencies. So I can be at a party and be high, 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 but then it's taken its toll on me and I have to go home. And, uh, and I have to recover. So it's like I, I get the best of both worlds and yet suffer with the, the, the consequences of both worlds as well. And what I love about John's gospel is straight away the first sign he gives us, it tells us that Jesus is at a party. It's, in fact, just read it together before we go any further. It says this in verse 1. It says, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding, which is good to know. This is not a a wedding that Jesus is gate crashing. Jesus has actually been invited. We'll come back to that in just a second. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, we have no more wine. He said, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, and I love that about Jesus' mother. This is a beautiful interaction between Jesus and his mother. We get very little of that in the scriptures. But I love that, that she has the, the respect but familiarity to say, to even when he says, my hour has not yet come, it's almost like she's saying, you will do what you're told. Jesus, you will do what you're told. And so she looks at, 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 at the, the servants and she says, just, just do what he tells you to do. It says, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars of water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet, who was the significant guest over, overseeing and presiding over the ceremony. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had now been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everybody brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have been too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of his signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Before we jump into some of those practical ways that we can facilitate God doing the miraculous in and through us, 
just to make some comments. First of all, this is we, we see that Jesus is invited to the party, which I think is huge for us to understand the reality that Jesus' life and humanity was so attractive that people wanted Him to be at their party. In fact, if you look at the, the first two chapters of John's Gospel, it's a little bit of, of a contradiction. You see in the first verses of, of, of John chapter 1, it tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, which is telling us what? It's speaking of Jesus' divine nature, that this Jesus who is about to be birthed into the human story is, a, is not just of earthly origin, He's of divine origin. That, that, that Paul tells us in Philippians that He left heaven to come down to earth, that this is divine Jesus. So in John chapter 1, we're seeing this, this beautiful linguistic exposure of the divinity and the power and the origin, the divine origin of Jesus himself. And then in John chapter 2, oh, Jesus, he was at a party. In John chapter 1, he's leaving heaven to come to earth and he is the divine God. In John chapter 2, this is someone you want to hang around with. This is someone you want to spend time with. Which I think as Christ followers, we need to take as seriously as we do John chapter 1. That we want to be the kind of people that people want to be around. Amen? We don't want to be the kind of people who don't get an invite to the party. Or if we do go to the party, the party changes in a bad way because we're present. That Jesus was, was aware enough that he could be at a party and he could mingle with people from all walks of life. He could mingle with the religious and he could mingle with the sinners. That's how relatable our Jesus is. That he's not just divine, but he has a level of humanity that is attractive. Let me ask you this. When people look at your life, do you have a level of humanity that people can engage with? Or are we just interested in quoting scriptures and verses and religiosity at people? That's not the church that Jesus wants. The church, of course, he wants a church that stands for truth and will make a stand. But he also wants a church that knows how to be present and human and empathize and understand and laugh. Amen? You know the kind of people you want at a party are the ones that are going to make you laugh. And what I love about Jesus is he takes the invitation. He doesn't say, oh, no, 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 I can't come. Number one, you're serving alcohol. I can't be at a party where alcohol is pleasant, present. The scholars tell us this, that Jesus turns water into wine and the church for many years has been trying to turn wine back into water. And it even says that the master of the ceremonies, he says, he comments to the bridegroom and he says this, why are you bringing out the best wine? At the end, that's not the, usually the way it works. Usually you wait till people have drunk too much and then you bring out the worst stuff. Some scholars tell us they believe that Jesus turns water into wine, but this is not alcoholic wine. Or if it is, it's only 1% or 2%. <laughs> like how do you get that from your biblical interpretation? Oh, no, no, I know. I know my Jesus. And he wouldn't do such a thing. Well, the first miracle Jesus does is he goes to a party and he's present and he's human and he's able to mingle and he's able not to just offend, but that there's something about him that's attractive enough that when there's a crisis in the midst of this party, people are drawn to him. People press in, lean him, lean into him. Come on, we need a revolution in the church as Christ followers that we could be people who don't repel others but that people who are drawn to when they have the toughest moments or where there's a moment of crisis, they say, you know what, I don't know what to do but I know my friend who knows Jesus and their life's different and there's something that they have that I want. It tells us that Jesus is invited to the party. It also tells us that Jesus is the answer to the solution, the crisis at the party. Now we know that, I know I've got, I've got friend, a friend who is Mexican and Puerto Rican heritage. And when I go around to his house to eat, it is a celebration of food. And when you go in, I remember sitting with his dad who had me in his home, invited into his home to eat his Puerto Rican food. And we ate together, we ate Lachon. 
Anyone ever had your lechon? No? It's, it's pork, but really beautiful pork. It's not just pork. It is beautiful pork. I mean, I'm telling you, that rind is crispy. It melts. Are you getting hungry? It melts in your mouth. And they serve up the most delicious Puerto Rican rice. And here's what I found out. My first time eating at a Puerto Rican's house. Here's what I found out. An empty plate is an offense. That literally straight away, and, and listen, I'm, I'm the kind of person, I load up, anybody else load up their plate first time around? And I'll load it up another time if I can. But I remember going around to his house and I loaded up my plate with this delicious pork and this delicious Puerto Rican rice. And I sat down and I ate it and I enjoyed it. And I'm the kind of person, I'm not a quiet eater, okay? I, I'm, I'm, I'm making all the noises. Oh, I'm smacking the table. This is so good. This is the best dang pork I have ever tried in my life. This Puerto Rican rice, it's better than any, it's better than any rice I've ever tasted. I'm usually just a plain basmati rice with a curry. But I tell you what, that, that Puerto Rican rice is something special. And straight away, I'd loaded up my plate. I'd finished it. I'd not even had a chance to breathe. And his father had taken my plate and he filled it up again. And he'd put it underneath my nose. And he sat next to me. He didn't speak a word of English, by the way. He sat next to me just smiling. And I said to Joey, what's happening? My friend. And he said, oh. When your plate's empty, we fill it. And you've got to eat it. If I must. <laughs> if I must partake a second time, I shall. And I ate it. Because what, what, what they're doing is they're expressing in their culture that hospitality is an inbuilt value. That the guest who sits at the table is to be provided for. And in the day and age in which Jesus lived and he performed this miracle, if you were attending a party and the premier party that you could attend in a culture was the party of the wedding. The wedding was the party. In fact, they tells us that the, the wedding feasts in these times could have gone on for days. Anybody up for that? Wine to flow for days, food to be eaten for days. That it sends the introverts crazy right now. You've got to shiver down your spine thinking, I'd for days and hours enough. <laughs> And, and here's what happens. To, to say that the wine has run dry is an offense. It's an offense. It tells you this, that the person who has hosted you at their party has not made significant uh, preparation for you as their guest. Such was a value as hospitality. In fact, the scholars tell us that if, if this had happened and Jesus didn't step in and perform the miracle, this family literally would have been blacklisted in their culture. That this is a family that doesn't value the guest. And they're not thinking about how to be hospitable. And this reputation would have stuck with them forever. And in steps Mary and Jesus. And Mary says this, she says, hey, Jesus, you're going to do something about this. And just two quick things. If you want to see the, the wine flow and the miraculous provision of God flow in your life. It's just two really quick, simple things. Firstly, Mary says it. He she turns to the, the servants and she says, do what he says. That's a great place to start. If you want to see Jesus do the miraculous in your life and in the situations you'll find yourself, just do what he says. What does his word say? How does his word express and, and, and detail to us about what, how we should act and interact and live? Just do what he says. And what I love about this is this is a picture of, of the gospel taking place right here. That Jesus wants to be present at not just the events of your life, but every season of your life. This is a picture of Jesus being present in a marriage, not just at a wedding ceremony. This is, this is a picture for us of Jesus being present with us in our workplace. This is a picture of Jesus being present with us in our parenting. This is a picture that, that Jesus wants to be present. And He wants to work through us. And He wants other people to encounter Him and His kingdom through the way that we live and speak and interact with others. But if you want to see it happen, first of all, you've just got to do what He says. Do what he says. Here's what I know most of the time in my life. My frustration is, is not that I don't know what to do. It's that I'm not doing what I should do. Anybody else? 
if we would just do what he says. You know, some of us maybe were saying, well, I've just not heard from God for a long time and I've just not seen him show up like he used to. I've just not felt his presence. Well, I, I bet this, if you would just do what he says, if you would just wipe the dust off the Bible, if you would just carve out some time, if you would just create some space in your day, if you would just stop for a minute, if you turn off the engine before you walk into work and you would take two minutes to say, Jesus, I'm inviting you into this day. And I say, God, be present in my workplace. Come to the party today. Come to the party and move. If you would just do what he says. Do what he says. I've got, a, I've got in my wardrobe at home, I've got a side of the wardrobe that I can wear and I've got a side of the, side of the wardrobe that I can't wear. The side of the wardrobe I can't wear is because I've put on too much weight to wear the clothes, but they're a, they're a little bit of a, a target for me that when I lose my weight, anybody else? When I lose my weight, I'm going to be able to put that on again. It, the problem isn't that I'm, I've got too much weight on me. The problem is I'm not exercising enough and I'm not watching what I eat enough. Anybody else? Because if I just do what I know to do, I would get what I want to get. It's the same in your relationship with God. If you would just do what He's told you to do, what you know to do, God could do something through you. God could do something. You say, well, that's not mind-blowing this morning. No, it's simple. But if we were to take a poll today, and we would say, are you doing what you know to do? Let's be honest, 90% of the room would probably say, not like I should. If you just do what he tells you to do. And the second thing is this, if you just do what you can. Do what he says to do and do what you can. It tells us this, that when the servants are there and they, Jesus says to them, get the six pots together. The six ceremonial pots, six in the biblical Narrative is representative of the number of man. So here's what God is saying. He is saying, bring what you can as man and now fill it with water. Which, which says what? It says that these servants are now not just waiting for Jesus to do a miracle. They are now part of the miracle because they're doing what they can do. Now for some of us, some of us in here, this is offensive. Because I want to do nothing, but God, I want you to do everything. Amen? God, would you, would you help my kids serve you and know you? Come on, it's all on God. But I'm not opening up the Scriptures myself or taking time to do devotionals with them or praying over them, putting my hands on them and praying for them. God, would you do them? Listen, He wants them to be world changers for Him. But you have a part to play as well. God, would you, would you heal my marriage? I'm not going to forgive her, God but you heal my marriage. Come on. Anybody else? God, would you give me the best marriage possible? I'm not going to spend any time with her. I'm not going to think about her. I'm not going to do it. Just God, you do it. Come on, that's not the way God works. And, and in the context of this miracle, here's what you have. You have two categories of people when it comes to the miracle. You have those who sip the miracle, but you have those who serve in the miracle. Think about that. That as these servants just fill these jars, it tells 180 gallons of wine, over a thousand bottles of wine. I wonder if this was a party trick Jesus used to do at home. Anyone want to grow up in Jesus' house? The wine never runs dry. And, and as, Mary, as Mary says, hey, come on, Jesus, you, you get involved. And you create some, as they fill the water. It doesn't tell us, the scripture doesn't tell us that at one moment Jesus says, thou hast water now become wine. Like we don't get that insight in the scripture. In my imagination, I imagine that the, the servants getting the water out of the big pots, ceremonial pots. I imagine them looking into it and it's still water. And he says, right, go now, give it to the master of the banquet. Do what you can. And here's what happens as they pull up to the table. And I imagine the servant thinking, now Jesus is out of sight. Nobody else knows this has happened. If anyone's going to look stupid, it's going to be me pouring water into the cup. But they do what he says and they do what they can. And as they pour the water in the cup, I imagine the servant watching it take place. Literally as they pour the water, they see the color change. 
and they go, this is awesome. Imagine that. Imagine seeing water turn in to wine. The only reason they got to see it happen is because they did what they could. They did what they could. No, I'm not pouring it, Jesus, until I see it red. Touch it now, and then I'll step out for you. Sort it all out, God, before I take a step of faith. Let me know with 100% certainty, anybody else like that, that this is going to work out. The truth is, until you pour, you don't know. Until you pour and you just take what you can and you put it in the cup, you don't know how it's going to work out. And it says that the master of the ceremony, he picks it up and he sips the miracle. But here's, here's the thing, I don't want you to miss this. The, the master of the ceremony, ceremony sips the miracle and he's astounded by the taste. But the servants serve in the miracle. And it tells us that nobody else knew at the moment that the wine was poured apart from the servants what had took place. There are two types of people, not just in the story. There are two types of people in church. There are those who want to sip the miracle. And there are those who get the blessing of serving in the miracle. And here's what I know. Here's what I know as people showed up early to set up for us today. As we unloaded a van and things were taken and distributed over, all over the building in kids' church, and in the baby nursery, and as hospitality set up. Here's what I know. Jesus didn't miraculously fill an urn with water in that back kitchen today. It took a team member to do what they could to fill that coffee, to fill that urn and to get that pre prepared. And here's what we believe. It, this, this morning as the worship team came in and they set up, and this week as I look over the message and I prepare, here's what I, here's what I get to do. I get to see the blessing of what God's doing and the worship team, team do too. They do what they can. But here's what I know about church is that when you do what you can, God will do what you can't. And so you came in here this morning from all walks of life, all backgrounds, so all kinds of things gone on in your world this week, all kinds of perceptions, all kinds of anxiety, all kinds, all kinds of stress, all kinds of worry, all kinds of issues. And as the music starts to play, and as people just do what they can, God begins to move in the hearts and lives of His people. And He begins to soften hearts. As, as the kids' church set up today and they did what they could, and as they teach the Scriptures to our children, as they do what they can, here's what I know, the Holy Spirit will take a seed of a word that is shared with a child, and He'll sow it into their heart and something supernatural will take place. Here's what I know that maybe some of you have not felt the presence of God. And as we worship in just a moment and we do what we can, here's what we're asking. Wet the wine floor, God. Turn our water into wine. That God, you ask us to do what you say. And if we do what we can, that God, you will do what we can't. So does anybody need some water into wine today? Some water into wine. Here's what I know. This isn't just a story of water becoming wine. This is symbolic of a new covenant being established right here in John chapter 2. That as Jesus, it tells us what? On the third day, right at the beginning of John chapter 2, on the third day. Now when we read the story, we understand the biblical significance of the third day, don't we? The third day is representative of what? Resurrection. Interesting that the, the number three is present straight away. And Jesus says, hey, I'm going to create some new wine here. Just, just, I'm going to speed up the whole process. Never mind the egg, the planting of the seed, the growing of the vine. Never mind the tending of, never mind the picking, never mind the fermenting of the grape. Never mind the, the crushing, never mind the, the, the whole process is changed in a moment for Jesus. He can speed things up that should take years. He can heal a marriage of years worth of trauma in a moment. And as you work it through with Him, you know, He can turn it around. You've never come too far. You've never gone too far. God can do it if you allow Him in. He can do it. And He takes, he takes water and He turns it into wine. What does it symbolize? The wine of the new covenant. Interesting that the six parts it tells us were ceremonial parts. They were used in the washing which represent what? It represents the old covenant, the law. 
And in this moment, he takes something that used to, to be used in the old and he creates something new. That his blood was shed. And his blood, which we shared in just a moment earlier in communion, is the blood of the new covenant. It's the new wine. It's the new wine. Anyone thankful for new wine? That Jesus takes our failings and our faults and he establishes a new system that is not built and based on you and me meeting a requirement, but it's based on his sacrifice. That this is a prophetic miracle. The blood will flow for a new covenant and Jesus will rise and establish it.